Well, we're almost there. We've made the final turn and we're heading down the home stretch. In other words, Christmas will be here in just three days. And I'll tell you, when I get to this point, as I have 63 times, I tend to feel the same sort of way. Well, maybe not the first four or five years, but, but since then. And I'll tell you, it, it, it's really not what I would have expected two weeks before. Now, I recognize that I'm only talking for myself, and my experiences may be radically different from what y'all are feeling right now. I, I know that. But when I get to these last few days, I sort of feel this weird sense of, of calm. Something I can guarantee wasn't there in the beginning of December. As a matter of fact, it's like this uncomplicated and uncluttered, almost childlike view of Christmas that I, that I seem to develop with all its simplicity and innocence and wonder. Of course, like I said, that wasn't the case a few weeks ago. I mean, back then, all the stuff that needed to get done was overwhelming. Good night, good night nurse. I had to get the Christmas tree assembled and haul all the decorations up from the basement and down from the attic. And even though these last few years I've done my shopping online, I still had to go and do it. I still had to go to the site and buy the stuff, which is another source of stress. More money seems to be going out than coming in. And as to my life around the church, trust me, Advent isn't exactly a relaxing time. You know, we do more than focus on chestnuts roasting on an open fire. Let's just say as we entered December, with all the decorating and with all the purchasing and with all the activities, my stress, left, my stress level was hovering somewhere between orange and red. But I can't say that's unusual. The same thing has happened every year starting right after Thanksgiving. But I've got to tell you, right now I'm feeling a real sense of peace. You see, in the last week before Christmas, my stress and my anxiety tends to tank, which is a good thing. And the reason, well, I don't think it's exactly rocket science. I mean, let's face it, when you get to this point, the stuff that's still in the basement and the attic will probably stay there for another year. And as to gifts, I've either bought them or come up with a good excuse for why they're going to be late. And right now, all I have to do is finish preaching this sermon that I have already written and do a traditional candlelight ser service I have done before. That's a no-brainer. Because we all know that Christmas Eve isn't the time to innovate, certainly not in the Presbyterian Church. And if you don't believe me, let me tell you about a colleague of mine who decided to change his whole approach to the night before Christmas and found himself not only alone on Christmas Eve, but called a Grinch by his congregation. No, by the time I get to this point in the Advent season, I really do feel this genuine sense of peace. And that's probably a good thing. Because this morning, we're, go we're going to talk about the last verse of the song we've sung each of these weeks as we've lit the Advent candle. I mean, after singing, we light the Advent candles against the winter night to welcome our Lord Jesus, who is the world's true light. On the first Sunday of Advent, we sang, the first one will remind us that Christ will soon return. We light it in the darkness and watch it gleam and burn. And with that in mind, we talked about the second coming of Jesus. And on the next Sunday, we added, we light the second candle and hear God's holy word. It tells us, cling to Jesus, prepare to meet our Lord. And during that service, we focused on how the Old Testament pointed to the coming of the Messiah, the, the coming of the Christ. And then last Sunday, we added, three candles now are gleaming and show us the true way. Rejoice, the Baptist cries out, your Lord has come today. And we looked at how John the Baptist can help us prepare to celebrate the advent of Jesus. Now, that's what we've done to this point. And this morning, as the fourth candle was lit, we sang, four candles burning brightly announced that Christ has come. Prepare my heart, believe it, and give the Christ child room. Now, that's what we sang. And because of that, we're going to focus on the peace that surrounded the birth of Jesus. And we're going to talk about this idea that we can best understand the coming of Christ when we take a step back and appreciate its almost childlike simplicity. 
And I'll tell you, when you think about it, peace and simplicity really is what the birth of Jesus is all about, especially when you read how it's described in the Gospel of Luke. For example, just consider the birth itself. This is what Luke wrote. About that time, Emperor Emperor Augustus gave orders for the names of the people to be listed in the record books. These first records were made when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Everyone had to go to his own hometown to be listed. So Joseph had to leave Nazareth and Galilee and go to Bethlehem in Judea. Long ago, Bethlehem had been King David's hometown, and Joseph went there because he was from David's family. Mary was engaged to Joseph and traveled with him to Bethlehem. She was soon going to have a baby, and while they were there, she gave birth to her firstborn son. She dressed him in baby clothes and laid him on a bed of hay because there was no room for them in an inn, in the inn. Now, that's what Luke wrote. And I don't know about y'all, but this doesn't seem all that impressive. You know, not in a CGI sort of way. I mean, where are the laser beams and the explosion and the special effects? This Man, this isn't a Michael Bay movie. And where are all the animals that started talking in a, in a Hanna-Barbera kind of way? My gosh, where's that beam, you know, that light that's trying to cut through the roof of the barn, spotlighting that cute little cuddly white, of course, baby. I mean, he certainly doesn't look Jewish. A child who was at least a couple of months old when he was born, lying in a manger, there with his mother looking amazing, given the fact that she'd just given birth. I can tell you Debbie didn't look like that right after Maggie was born. She was, and she was in a hospital, not a stable. No, when you get right down to it, as described by Luke, this is pretty, a pretty unimpressive birth. And I think we can say the same sort of thing about the first people who came to see Jesus. Again, according to Luke, that night in the field near Bethlehem, some shepherds were guarding their sheep. All at once, an angel of the Lord came down to them from the Lord, or an angel came down to them from the Lord, and the brightness of the Lord's glory flashed around them. The shepherds were frightened. But the angel said, Don't be afraid, I have good news for you, which will make everyone happy. This very day in King David's hometown, a Savior has been born for you. He is Christ the Lord. You will know who he is because you will find him dressed in baby clothes and lying in a bed of hay. Suddenly many other angels came down from heaven and joined in praising God. They said, praise God in heaven, peace on earth to everyone who pleases God. After the angels had left and gone back to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem and see what the Lord has told us about. They hurried off and found Mary and Joseph, and they saw the baby lying in a bed of hay. When the shepherds saw Jesus, they told his parents what the angel angel had said about him. Everyone listened and was surprised. But Mary kept thinking about about all this and wondering what it meant. As the shepherds uh, returned to their sheep, they were praising God and saying wonderful things about him. Everything they had seen and heard was just as the angel had said. Now, I know, I know, this part of the story is pretty impressive. I mean, it has flashing angels who sang in a heavenly choir. And let's get real, that really is impressive. But But the guys who heard, you know, who heard this, man, they just weren't. They were shepherds for crying out loud. And do you have any idea where shepherds stood in the ladder of success in ancient Judea? Well, to be honest, they weren't on the bottom rung. That was reserved for children and women and and foreigners. But right above them were, guess who? Shepherds. Let's just say the only parents who wanted their boys to grow up to be shepherds were shepherds. And yet it was to those rough men that the announcement came. And they were the ones who first saw Jesus. And after seeing him, they returned to their flocks and were, guess what, never heard again. I mean, if the birth was unimpressive, the ones to whom it was announced, man, they were mega unimportant. 
And yet I believe this is extremely important for us to remember as we make our final approach to our celebration of Christmas. For example, because his birth was so unimpressive, that reminds us that Jesus really was and is one of us. You see, he wasn't some sort of star child beamed down to earth. He didn't spring from the head of Zeus like Athena, nor was his birth the result of an elaborate game between the gods like Hercules. No, the birth of Christ just wasn't dramatic at all. And I'll tell you, that's a good thing, at least for us. You see, we don't need to be superior to follow his example. And we don't need to be godlike to be his disciples. And we sure don't need to be perfect to be considered his brothers and sisters. Instead, we can be exactly who we are. Men and women who are made of flesh and blood, but also animated and inspired by God's Spirit. Human beings who are a collection of all kinds of things, both good and not so good. A race of folks who are both sugar and spice and everything nice, as well as snips and snails and puppy dog tails. You see, because Jesus was a real person, he was the son of man, he was like us, we can find direction in his life. And we can find freedom in his death, and we can find genuine hope in his resurrection. You see, his birth reminds us that Jesus really was like one of us. And since the first folks called to see him were a pretty motley bunch, well, that can remind us that he really did, did come to call other motley people. You know, people like, guess who? Like we are. You see, his message was never intended for just the high and the mighty or those who are important, or even self-important. And we got plenty of those in our world today. Rather, he came to be the savior for folks on every rung of the socioeconomic ladder, with particular focus on the guys and camels near the bottom. Because they may have a greater need to feel secure than those at the top. And I'll tell you why I believe that's so important for us to recognize and to accept right here and now. Since shepherds were the first to the manger, our relationship with him isn't about who we are or even who we expect to be. And it isn't about the work we've done or even the work we promised to do. And it sure isn't about what we've achieved or even what we believe we're capable of achieving sometime in the future. As a matter of fact, when it comes to our relationship with Christ, it really doesn't start with us at all. It all begins with him who he was, and what he's done for us. Therefore, all we can really do is to trust and believe, you know, trust in his work and believe in his promises. You see, it really is good news that some pretty unimportant people were the first to come because that can actually give us hope that we'll be included too. And so there it is, the birth of Jesus. And now as we move into the last few days before Christmas and our pace settles into something less hectic and more peaceful, maybe we'll be able to appreciate the simplicity of the whole story. And remember that based on his birth, Jesus really was like us. And thanks to those who were first invited to come, we can believe that we'll be invited too. And I'll tell you, that really is good news. Something we can understand when we claim the simplicity and the innocence and the wonder that children can feel this time of year. Because let's get real, when it comes to Christmas, truly wonderful the mind of a child is. Amen. <laughs>